Sure. Yeah, I think we can go ahead and get started. And uh, we'll just be doing some introductions at first. So we'll still give folks a few minutes to trickle in as we're doing that and um, uh, before we get into our project for today. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this session. We are the internalized stigma interest group that formed out of the Howard Conference a few years ago now. And we formed this group to have a space for really anyone and everyone who shares an interest and a passion for understanding internalized stigma and doing what we can in our various capacities and our various roles to reduce the stigma that so many feel. In our group, we have researchers, service providers, community advocates, all types of community members. Um, we have creative directors, we have um, just a whole diverse group of folks that come together and um, meet once a month and we share updates about our work that is related to stigma or not related sometimes as well. Um, we share our different events with each other so that we can support um, stigma related events that our different group members are doing um, and spread the word about various projects. We brainstorm projects together and problem solve um, different things that come up related to our work. Um, and also we just gather to build community and discuss internalized stigma and the various ways that it manifests. Um, we're always really excited to welcome new members to our group. Um, we're hoping that after this conference, we'll have a bunch of new members um, so in a moment, we will put the put a link in the Zoom chat for um, anyone can click to join our group. And um, basically the group also kind of serves as an email list. And then that's also where we send out the information for our monthly meetings. Um, so I believe Joe will put that link in the chat in a moment. And um, and uh, also as a heads up, if you have any difficulty um, joining through that link, please feel free to also put your email in the chat. Um, I believe the so we operate with a Google group, so you may have to log in with a Google account. Um, so feel free to reach out to us if you um, have any issues with that or leave your email in the chat. Um, today we will be presenting a project, a photo narrative project that we put together as an interest group, which Alicia will give the background and kind of introduce the project a bit in a moment. Um, but I just want to take a moment to introduce our speakers. Um, so I'm Emily. I am a second year graduate student in clinical psychology at the University of California, Irvine. Um, and I will... Um, Next, have Joe introduce himself. Awesome. It's great to be here. Thanks for the uh, very nice overview, uh, Emily, of our work group and, and what we do. Uh, so yeah, I'm Joe DeLuca. I'm a clinical psychologist by training. Um, I've been presenting at and part of the Howard uh, University International Conference on Stigma for last like two or three years now. It's a great place to be. Um, and I met Alicia when I was training uh, out in Maryland, and she'll talk a bit about herself in a moment. Uh, but now I'm an assistant professor at Fairfield University in Connecticut. And I uh, am a psychology professor, do research on stigma uh, and also serious mental illness uh, among young people. Um, so I will pass it over to uh, Alicia next, uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Oh, you're muted, Alicia. Sorry, you caught me. I was sending the link to another of our colleagues who somehow couldn't get to the right place and then the windows were in the wrong place, so sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm Alicia Luxted. I'm in Baltimore, Maryland, on the uh, middle of the East Coast of the United States. I'm a clinical community psychologist and uh, work have worked for the last, I don't know, 15 or so years um, in, in creating resources, applied research testing them, and uh, some advocacy uh, around, particularly around mental health and stigma, or the stigma of mental health problems, but also other things, addiction, um, sexual orientation is another area that I worked in a lot um, within the mental health 
world and destigmatizing and staff education and things like that. So um, uh, Joe really ca uh, captured the reason that uh, that I'm here in terms of how we created this uh, this interest group. And so um, I'll leave it at that. And who's left, Emily? I got distracted when I was trying to send the link to Kristen. Yeah, so <clears throat> next we'll have Rick introduce himself. Sorry, Rick. <laughs> oh, that's OK. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Rick Guasco. I um, work at Positively Aware Magazine, which some of you might know. It's an HIV treatment and health magazine published by a nonprofit service, uh, services organization here in Chicago called TPAN. Um, the magazine has been publishing for over 30 years, uh, offering inform uh, information about HIV treatment and health. Um, this year marks my 30th year living with HIV. And in fact, when I was first diagnosed, one of the things I was handed was a copy of Positively Aware. So I have a very uh, personal connection to this publication. Um, I am the, uh, for the last 12 years, I was creative director of the magazine. Recently, our editor in chief uh, went on to work for the Reunion Project, and I've stepped in as acting editor in chief. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for introducing yourselves. And once again, welcome. Um, <clears throat> If you're just joining us, we are the Internalized Stigma Interest Group, and um, we'd love to have any and all of you join our group. We meet monthly, and today we will be presenting a photo narrative project that we put together, um, which Alicia will talk more about in a moment. And um, just wanted to mention as well that some of our contributors to the project who submitted photos and captions for this project may also be in the audience today. So shout out to everyone who submitted their photos um, to this project. And we're really excited to, um, to show it and, and display it today. So I'll kick it over to you, Alicia. Yeah, thanks. So as, um, as Emily was describing, there's all sorts of people that have been involved in our interest group. And we have really enjoyed comparing notes across all different kinds of work and all different kinds of organizations or non-organizations. And that led us to thinking about what could we, what could we all do together um, you know, to kind of knit that together. And that, roughly speaking, is what landed us on this particular project. In the conference, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard, I know I have a lot of really um, accomplished people, a lot of dogged um, work to reduce stigma in HIV, in other areas. And um, this is a little bit different. Um, photo narratives are just another way of people expressing their realities, their experiences, their views on some common theme um, where people take photos um, and then you know, put captions with them, a, a, a line, a paragraph, so that the two travel together, photo narrative, to just encapsulate some portion of their experience that relates to a common theme. And that's what links them all together, is the common theme. Um, in uh, formal ways, in social justice work and some in research work, there's a, a method of photo narratives called photo voice that maybe some people have heard of. Um, that's just the same thing. It's just a specific way of doing it. And uh, ours is a little more a little more loose and generic, so we're not calling it that specifically. Um, so we um, put our project together around the theme of um, of see me, of how do I want to be seen, how am I seen in the social environment. That's the environment that's referred to in our title, and you'll see more about that in the um, in the exhibit itself. So exhibits like this are, or compilations like this, are used in lots of different ways, just for humanizing a problem, for um, speaking truth to power and um, policymakers sometimes for self-expression. There's all different ways. And so uh, one of the things we are interested in talking about later is, uh, so what should we do with this? So my job is just to um, explain what I did about what it is that we're, you're going to see, but then also tell you just how we're going to structure this session, which is perhaps a little bit different. Um, first, Rick, 
and maybe Joe too, I don't know, work it out, um, are going to go through our exhibit, the photo narratives, um, fairly quickly, just so you can kind of see it as an overall exhibit or an overall art piece. And um, then uh, Rick will have a few comments because he is the one who put it together. People submitted their work and he curated it. Um, so he might have a few comments on that. But then we're going to go back through it more slowly, image by image or photo narrative by photo narrative, so that if there are some of the photographers here who want to say something, they can, although no pressure, fine to be it's completely anonymous. You don't have to identify yourself at all if you don't want to. But also that some of you all may have some questions or some reactions. And I know Joe has a few uh, questions, prompt questions prepared. So we could really discuss. Um, and we'll go through it more slowly. Uh, and then hopefully end with some ideas about hmm, how could this be useful in our overall, like the whole conference's goal of, of reducing stigma. So that is our game plan. Um, and so I will turn it over to Rick and Joe. Thank you, Alicia. I suppose this is the point where I should share my screen and begin going through the slides. Sure. Okay. All right. Bear with me. All right. Can you see that? Yep. Looks great. Okay. So, as Alicia said, self expression, that turned out to be the opening point um, that so many people seized upon in, in creating these images and then submitting them. What you're going to see is not only uh, selfies, but actually people, uh, a number of people took this as an opportunity to create in some instances, artwork specifically for, um, for the See Me campaign. Um, some people wanted to show how they see themselves. Other people showed how they think other people see them. And then others decided to, how do they want to present themselves? So starting with Tessa Jelani, um, her selfie is one where her smile is such a powerful thing. And in fact, um, her caption, a wave of love. <clears throat> I think you can also say it's a wave of happiness. You can't help but smile back um, at the image that she offered up. Similarly, Janice, she says, admiring my inner <clears throat> and outer beauty. And I think you can sense, a sen uh, you can sense the self-confidence and the happiness, the internal happiness that she has that's projected outward in this image. Michelle Harris, this is a woman who definitely is empowered because she's an advocate, a volunteer, and co-chair of the Ryan White uh, program in Indianapolis. And she makes the point that women of color are especially vulnerable to HIV, but she's one who is actually taking control of her situation and is advocating on behalf of women like herself. Now, this one was especially affecting. And note that this came from someone in the Philippines. That's the reach that this campaign had. And um, what Art is saying here is he's talking about uh, victims and um, the stain that, they, that people living with HIV can sometimes feel that they have. And um, more effectively, sometimes the way that people living with HIV are, view, are viewed as being stained. And I think it's a, it's a rather strong image. You, you can't help but not only react to the image, but feel for, um, for art, for the person who's in this photograph. Now, Brian C. Jones, he talks about um, having, a super, having a superpower and wanting to stand up as a uh, as an advocate for all people living with HIV. And you can see there are rays of light emanating from him in this picture. Philip's picture, <clears throat> excuse me, um, starts off with the thousand yard stare. And 
in this one, I think it's about how difficult it is for him to see himself and for others to perceive him. And that's an issue that many of us face living with HIV. You know, he talks about alienation and not fitting in. And of course, sometimes there are aspects of mental of illness that, um, that factor into this. Now, Shaquilla's image, she talks about, well, she says, hello, beautiful. And she certainly is, especially with that smile. And she makes the very interesting comment. She don't look like she have HIV. And that speaks to oftentimes the stigma that we face, that um, the perception that only certain kinds of people get HIV, or you know, if you have HIV, you've got a certain look about you. And I think that Shaquilla's photo triumphs over that. From Uganda, we have this image. I am strong, brave, and I'm a warrior. She, her strength goes beyond living with HIV. And I might add um, that, um, you know, in Uganda, uh, the stigma against HIV is especially strong. So this is a picture of triumph. Fatima created this work of art. And again, note that she's in Pakistan. And she says, society sees me as flawed, broken, fractured. I see myself as an internal creative spirit. And it's, the create, it's her creativity, I think, that powers her above the stigma that she must face. And again, um, Pakistan is not a place where um, it's easy to be somebody living with HIV. And um, her second image there uh, captures um, perhaps the, uh, the challenges she faces regarding mental health. Karanja in Kenya starts off with erotic and frustration. And I think you can see the erotic nature of this image, but also the frustration. And it's an interesting combination of the two. And it creates a beautiful, compelling image. She talks about um, the dilemma she faces um, between her past and uh, looking back, but that, um, and then also again about pleasure. And it, 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 it's interesting that there are these different forces at play, but I think it creates a striking image. And then powerful hand, mano poderosa. Um, we don't have much of a caption here, but I think this, uh, this image evokes so many different feelings and you can see that uh, there's religious imagery here that's, that's employed. And oftentimes um, how we feel about ourselves living with HIV can often be driven by um, our religion, our faith. Uh, for better and unfortunately sometimes for worse. Now this one, this is a simple image, but I think it's the caption that that makes uh, that that gives power to this image, gives it meaning. So it's the feeling of uh, it takes a lot of energy to resist bending too much to keep that box from crushing in on me. And I think so many people who have to contend with so many opposing forces, both external and internal, feel that way too. And then we have Pepe from Miami, who the greatest challenge he faces is internalized homophobia and uh, the phobia of living with HIV. And I think that um, it's a very vulnerable and honest image. It, it's a selfie, but it is still, um, the expression on his face says so much. And then you have um, Demario Richardson, and you can't help but smile back and see that there's a, there's a sense of 
confidence in who he is. And I think that's something that we should all be fortunate to have. Dashida in North Carolina. Now, what strikes me is the, uh, the juxtaposition between her smile and then what she says for identity. It is heartbreaking because we are all equal in humans. And you can't deny the humanity that you see in her smile. And then we have here Angel from the United Kingdom, I, I believe from London. And um, there's a karma camellia, chameleon reference, um, if you see in their caption. Oops, I'm sorry. And then lastly, we have Tavares from New Orleans, who created this beautiful, beautiful superhero image that recalls Black Panther. And he says, I praise the name of God for allowing me to find purpose and meaning in the midst of tragedy. And I would say self-empowerment, looking at that image. So there you have it. Those are the images that were offered up by people just about from all over the world living with HIV. And well, we'll get to that one later, but here, Joe, if you want to have me go through these from the beginning and maybe offer up some additional comments. And if there's anybody out there, um, if any of the people who took part in See Me are among the uh, our audience here, certainly uh, feel free to step in and offer your own additional comments and remarks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm first going to give uh, Rick uh, a Zoom round of applause here, as soon as we're not in person. <laughs> very, very nice job. I really appreciate you going through that, Rick, so thoughtfully and deliberately. Right. Yeah, I've seen this before. It was really nice to slow down and hear your commentary and see what was going on in the chat and really, you know, see these people and, and feel their stories. Um, and I just want to echo real quick what Rick said as well in terms of if anyone is here um, who put their picture out and would like to speak about it further, feel free to you know, write that in the chat or you know, put your hand up. Uh, we'd be happy to um to have you talk. And then I think we have one uh already. So maybe we could start there and then sort of uh go on uh michelle harris you have your hand up good morning good afternoon everyone i'm michelle um can you hear me yeah i guess so yes. um i do the work that i do because i love people mm -hmm. and when people don't feel the love they tend to go inside themselves and usually it's very harmful and it's hurtful, the thoughts that they will begin to think when they think that nobody cares for them and cares about them. Um, as all of us know, this is that time of season when the depression and the disparities and all of that are at its peak and, and um, suicide. So, mm -hmm. I always think of others and what they're doing. And I try to make myself available for others um, about stigma, about um, mental health, about just getting out and socializing. When you socialize, what some people don't understand is when you're in an environment with someone else with, with HIV, you don't have to talk about HIV. That is not that is not why we try to get together unless there's something that we need to talk about. But we can talk about fun things. We can talk about if you like to bowl, we can talk about bowling. If you like to cook, we can talk about cooking. So the narrative and the conversation does all does not always have to deal around HIV, which is is good that it does to keep you informed. But I would prefer that it's about other things women getting together, doing fun things, going to lunch, going to brunch, going to teas, socializing. That way you don't forget about why you're here 
to start with. You know, you're here to enjoy yourself, but yes, your health must come first with all of this. Your health has to come first, but just remember who you are and why you're here is to enjoy yourself, enjoy your family and friends, even if that family is an adopted family, because most of mine are adopted family by, mm -hmm. by people that are paws. And so I, I accept them wholeheartedly, openly, and I love them all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Michelle. Well, beautifully said. We're, we're so glad you're here. I was wondering if the folks in the images were here, and it's um, such a lovely image and set of statements here. And we really respect the work you do and, and also everything you're saying right now, right? It's a tough time of the year, at least. Um, you know, in the West with the changing seasons, right? I mean, it was sort of going on that seasonal affective type stuff and just general equity issues in terms of reaching variety health, a variety of health services. Um, and I just want to highlight again, I could hear it in your voice and see it in your image, your uh, smiles contagious. And I'm, I'm so glad that Rick was highlighting those as we went through, because I, I can't help but, but smile either. So Really appreciate you being here, sharing this, and um, sharing verbally with us here uh, as well. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to the rest of the conferences and all of the new people that I will be meeting, because my family is getting larger on a daily basis. I swear it is. I mean, I can <laughs> remember everybody's name, but I can remember your face. That's right. That's right. Oh, wonderful! What a great way to to start this off. Um, Rick, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything there or if you wanted to add anything generally, you know, like what it was like going through this, because I, I know you, you do a day with HIV, if you wanted to share a bit about that it's kind of overlaps with images and people's stories. Well, um, a day with HIV is a little different in that, uh, the concept behind that is to portray 24 hours, a specific day in the lives of people living with HIV. And uh, so it, it's usually just snapshots of moments. Uh, some people um, put a little creativity into that picture that they take. But um, what uh, that's why this campaign, See Me, was different because it gave people the opportunity. Um, there was a call to be creative. And um, as you saw, quite a few people took the opportunity um, to do something, to create an image specifically yeah. for this campaign. This was an opportunity for self-expression. And I think sometimes people living with HIV don't feel that they have that opportunity for self-expression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well said, Rick. Yeah, definitely some differences with uh, a day with uh, HIV, which um, occurs in September, right? Yes, it takes place on the first day of fall. Okay. Uh, the, the idea being that it's a change of seasons and it's a time for change of thinking. Perfect, perfect. So yeah, it's just a bit of a tangible. We'll certainly keep our, our work group updated on that, you know, as that uh, occurs every year. But um, yeah, it was really nice to see the ownership, sort of what you're saying over people's stories. Um, and I saw that come out in in just about all of them, just the resilience and the power around them and the strengths people highlighted, you know, for having these stigmatized identities. Um, and to that point, it, it makes me think of, uh, you know, one of uh, many experts we have in the room, uh, Kristen uh, Kosalik, who is a uh, psychology professor and stigma researcher, um, who's been helping out you know, with this work group and with this campaign. Um, and Kristen, yeah, I see your, your image there. Yeah, I was just wondering what thoughts you had and if you wanted to speak to a bit of the power of storytelling based on your research and you know, what you know. Sure, Joe. Well, thanks Thanks for the kind words, first of all. Um, I think the people who shared their images with us are, um, are experts in, in a really important way. Um, and I think that's what this, the power of storytelling really is. Um, so to give you some context, I uh, run a research lab at USF called the Stigma Action Research Lab. Um, all the research we do aims to understand and address the stigma surrounding mental health conditions. I saw that Dr. Lockstead put in the chat that, you know, just to, just for clarity that 
the call here was really for all types of stigmatized uh, identities that might um, want to want to tell their story through photo narrative. Um, so one of the community partners that I've worked with the longest, so for six years now, is an organization called This Is My Brave, um, and their 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 hashtag is Storytelling Saves Lives. Um, and, you know, I, I felt that anecdotally um, for a very long time, but I think that the data that we're gathering around this program suggests that that is very much the case. Um, so what This Is My Brave does is they uh, make a call to the community. They issue a casting call uh, for people living with mental health conditions to come forward and tell their stories live on stage. Um, and they do so through various um, forms of creative expression. So that could be monologue, um, poetry, song. Uh, they've had a mime take that this is my brave stage. Um, and so my experience with that, in addition to just having had the opportunity to go through this process with you all, um, I think that the power of telling your story is really about no longer being um, shamed into silence by stigma. Um, and I think that there's it, what's become more and more fascinating to me is that there's different ways that we can tell our stories. So this is my brave is one way. Um, telling your story to your neighbor is another way. Um, not everybody has to take the stage or share their their photo or their narrative um, at such a scale. But I do um, want to just say thank you to the folks that did submit their um, pieces for um, See Me because uh, not everybody's at a point in their um, experience with their identity that they're ready or willing to do that. And stigma does exist. So there are some concerns around disclosure. Um, but I think that, you know, in an ideal world, the more and more of us that are able to share about this, um, the, the less stigma has power. Um, so I don't know if that kind of gets at what you were hoping to hear, Joe. Um, Absolutely, Kristen, and I, and I love that tagline. I forgot that that was it or didn't know for this is my story telling saves lives. How um, apt and, and powerful is that and true? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I, and I also love how you say you, know, you could do it in different mediums, right? And we even see that here in terms of you know, we have a bunch of selfies, we've got, you know, more traditional artwork like Fatima and uh, Karanja, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and just the way they, they've translated sort of, I think Fatima talks about translating her pain, right, into, into this and getting it out there and, and having a voice. So, um, yeah, right, we know in, you know, all sorts of ways this can be powerful just to get your voice out there, own that story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would just add, you know, that I don't think I went far enough with this, this train of thought. And that's, um, you know, that one thing I've learned in working with this is my brave, because that's a very public form of storytelling. You're taking the stage, you're being recorded, the recording is out there on YouTube. Um, as I mentioned, not everybody's ready or ever will want to tell their story in that way. And so I think that these different forms of creative expression give people an opportunity to be empowered through sharing their story at a level of disclosure that they're comfortable with. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong, you know, we, we didn't require that people put their names to their stories here. Um, I, I noticed that was something that was striking to me is I noticed a lot of people chose to, which is great. But had you not chosen to, that would have been equally okay and valid. And it gives people who are at different places an opportunity to be empowered in that way and, and feel seen, right? Like going back to the name of this, of this project, See Me. So yeah, it's very powerful. Yeah, thank you for that, Kristen. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I was also you know, impressed and a little surprised. You know, how many people wanted to you know share their name and be out there it's 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 very powerful to to see that link to the image and people feeling comfortable to do that and and again not an easy thing to do because we know there's stigma out there and it's real uh but at the same time we know it's one of the best ways to reduce stigma right get those stories out there talk about those yeah. great well, wonderful. Thanks so much, uh, Kristen. I'm I'm wondering if anyone else, uh, it could be people who have submitted things, just people in the audience, if you wanted to share anything or ask questions. Um, an additional open question we've had that we, we don't necessarily need to come to an answer today, 
but you know we're wondering what to do with this after you know we might put it on you know the, the Howard University International Stigma website or find another place to, to host it right and I know well, Rick is at like credits yeah, at the end. Yeah. this is Alicia I wondered because we have 60 some odd people on I wondered if maybe pausing at each one and asking if people have any questions or thoughts about each one might might help us kind of you know come together and uh, as well as that bigger question well, I see that Brian has, has raised his hand, and uh, so we've got uh, his picture up on the screen here. Maybe he wants to talk about it. Thanks. Uh, and, uh, well, and I didn't necessarily, um, well, I can't talk about my picture, too, but I, I, I often feel that, <clears throat> and I understand the essence of the project, but I often tell people I don't have a story because I'm not here to amuse you. I'm not, and I have chapters of my life that I haven't lived yet. And it's not like a movie with a beginning, a climax, although my life has had several climaxes now <laughs> and an ending, but I have immense insight into this pandemic epidemic. And so through my picture, I wanted to show that I, I have been through so many different things, so many different, it was almost like being a superhero and going through a time travel zone because I, you know, being diagnosed, this is my 39th year of having an AIDS diagnosis. So I have seen all the different annals of time and how HIV, and I have been there, and somehow I've gained some type of superpower to help other people. And I wish I had more hands to help other people. That's why the double image kind of played, resonated with me when I, when I sent this in, that I had many arms, and I had many things to deflect the stigma. The different rays are fighting off the stigma. And it's also uh, representative of how many different layers of stigma exist, not just within covert and overt, but within internal stigma. There's so many different layers of internal stigma. And even after 39 years, I still jump off that high board. But whether I jump into that swimming pool with no water, or a swimming pool that's going to make some waves and splash because I have a, a group of support there to catch me. So that's me. <laughs> Beautiful, Brian. I'm so glad you're oh, here. Oh, yeah. 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 Accidentally, <laughs> need to add something. Oh. Wow. Hi. Hello? No, what happened? Oh, it's right. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just wanted to, I could feel the power uh, from this, Brian. And um, I don't know if I caught exactly what you were saying early on, but um, about sort of having a story and sharing that. But I don't know if you were getting that sort of like it could be draining sometimes, like having to share that or you know, talk about that identity or, or the stigma. Well, a lot of times people come and say, can you come tell your story? Right. I, 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 don't, I don't need you. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. Right. This is not a pity party. I, and, and I can't come tell you what happened to me without telling you, without giving you tools mm -hmm. to prevent it from happening to you. So it's more of an educational session than me telling my story. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, the, 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 my HIV <laughs> narrative is only a small part of my life. Right. Al although it's an important part of my life and I can expound on it, but there are other factors surrounding it that makes my story resonate even more and it becomes insight. It becomes... Mm -hmm. uh, a narrative, it becomes a journey, it becomes an expedition, it becomes all these things that are so much more than, oh, he did this, oh, poor him, he got HIV, he got what he deserved, all these other comments coming in. It's my, my, my lament coming mm -hmm. out to you, so. <laughs> Makes sense, Brian. I see uh, Alicia's off mic, you might want to add something. I'll, I'll just quickly add, I, I think of what Michelle said here as well, Brian, around, you know, this not just being my identity, right? I just want to hang out and talk about general things with my friends, right? This is a part of who I am, you know, this sort of piece of me, but it's not all of who I am, right? That's, I'm not walking around being this, this stigmatized identity. Yeah.
I didn't know if you, Alicia, or, or someone else wanted to add something there. Just saw people off mic for a second. Um, well, no, but that was, but Brian's comments, as you put together also, as Michelle has made me think about that there can be in, in this, um, in dealing with stigma, we often talk about it is useful to be out, uh, as someone said, to let people know your stories, your status, whether it's HIV or schizophrenia or whatever else. And that that is true. It helps to humanize and it's hard for us to hold in our heads, um, for others to hold in their heads stereotypes if when they get to know the three dimensional person. I think that's all true. And at the same time, uh, this is not what you said, Brian, but it was what they made me think about. There's a real there's a real cost for that. There can be an objectification. There can be a like a fetishizing, you know, that you are this kind of person or you are in that category or, you know, any story, no matter if you took if any of us took three days to tell our, our personal story, it would be incomplete. So it's only one little slice of our story. And then people think they know you. It can be really stressful to be the one that's out in front and to be asked to um to be on display, uh, have certain aspects of yourself be on display. And so it's a really powerful social strategy, but it also is, you know, mm -hmm. it, it takes a, a cost. So um, I don't know, that's just what it made me think about, it, although I guess that's a little more negative than maybe no, we there is a, Like you said, there is, a, there is a lot at stake when you put your, your, your likeness out there. Uh, even with people putting their names and just their city or whatever, there is a there's always a cost to to stepping out. Uh, there's the reality of criminalization laws. Uh, there's the reality of of people having um, what is that? Not jealousy, but envy. A lot of times, you find people who I get the most flack from people in the HIV community in terms of criticism. And but a lot of times I have to brush it aside because I know that many of it comes from a place of people wanting to be as open as I am about my status. You can find my status or information about me about me at any public restroom across America on the wall <laughs> if it need be. So, but a lot of times people envy envy that being able to be open about their status. So I have to step back and say it's not me that the arrows or knives are being thrown at. It's the fact that people, you have something that people want. And, and so I just have to keep stepping, hoping that some of what I have will, will rub off on them or they'll get the courage to put one foot out there or even one toe and start, you know, so. Absolutely, Brian. Thank you. It's complicated to, to navigate. And, and again, we so appreciate you sharing your story here. I love this image too. Um, this is great. Uh, in terms of the structure you mentioned before, Alicia, I think that works really well. So yeah, if we wanted to pause on a, another one, maybe in, uh, yeah, maybe Janice here uh, and see if people had any uh, comments, reactions, questions, perhaps. This is great. See a lot of resilience coming out here. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it makes a difference in knowing Janice too, yeah. <laughs> you know, because this is her in, in, in all his glory, you mm -hmm. know, and, and everything you see radiating from her in this picture radiates in person. So I think those who know her can really, you know, feel the joy and the warmth and the, hey, give me a hug coming uh -huh. from the picture. So uh, I can feel that. I can totally see that, Brian. And I see uh, Michelle has a hand. If you want to add to this too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate you. I have always appreciated my brother, Brian. Um, I have. Um, this work This work is very tugging and pulling on your heartstrings and getting people to understand how to live their life outside the box. Uh, because most people want to live it inside the box and they don't really know how to go outside that box. So you have to continue to do what you do and to let people know there is nothing wrong with you. There is nothing wrong with you. You have a, a, um, 
a virus um, that's just like diabetes, sickle cell or anything else, it needs management. So you just have to manage your care. You know, with anything else, you have to manage your care. And that's just how I see it. Now, I didn't really become uh, real public with my status until I moved to Indianapolis because that's where I felt the most love from the people that I'm around. So for, for like seven years, I felt like an ostrich in a hole. But when I moved two hours down the road, I was just two hours away. When I moved two hours down the road, everything changed because of the people that were there for me. The people that were there for me showed me the love that gave me that extra push that say, you can do this. Mm. And I love them so much for sticking by me and always having uh, interesting information for me to learn about and people to learn and people people to meet and grow from you know mm -hmm. uh it's 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 you have to push yourself a little bit harder each day to meet new people to to learn what's new out there on the market whether it's medication people places to go or whatever it's something there to be learned and challenge yourself with every day you just have to push yourself on and, and get it done. You know, it's funny when you talked about the box. Uh, and I saw myself, have you ever had brought something and then you realize you want to keep the container and you try to pull it out the trash and, and restructure it again? I find myself, I've, I've been stepped on my box, damaged it, flattened it out. And there have been times when I wish I could go back and retrieve that box. But I, I just saw myself trying to pull it out and, and make it a box again, like like that image, this new image here. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but like I say, the work that the I've been following you for years. I've been following you for years. Even before I met you, I have been following you. And uh my girl D Connors, all of all of y'all, I've been following for years. And then when I finally got a got a chance to meet y'all, it felt like I've been knowing you for years. You know, I just felt that way. And it's like y'all home people. This is this is, you know, these are people that that uh are going through the same things that everybody else is going through. And we're trying to make everybody else in this world that are living positive know that there is nothing else, there's nothing wrong with you. You just continue to take your medication and continue to be yourself and continue to reach out to others because that's the whole thing. Each one bring one. Each one bring one. Are you okay? Are you okay? I can't hear you. You don't, you don't, you, you. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm doing, okay. you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah. Um, yeah, but each one just bring one with you to the to the table to to learn something different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's great seeing the love here, and it connects to the chat. I see uh, people talking about community, right? Finding that space, uh, the right your people, your your family, right? it's your adoptive family, your your homies. Um, it's great. I see we're on. And if I may, uh, um, Joe, yeah. yeah. What strikes me about, for me personally, what strikes me about these images is that being um, a, a gay Latino male of a certain age, mm -hmm. um, I see these pictures and I connect with them. Uh, it's, it transcends, um, it's, I might see someone who on the surface, I might not have anything in common with them except the fact that we're both living with HIV. And that's the starting point to discover that I actually have much more in common with them than it would appear to be on the surface. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's one of the very important things about this campaign. Yeah, what a nice way to tie this together, Rick. And I, I think that's a, a big part of, like you're saying, why you're so powerful, it's the shared humanity, right? may not look on the surface you know we have similarities but we we definitely do
we have a few more minutes here if anyone else wanted to add either to Trakila's or, or this one. I know, I know Rick is uh, bringing us through them. So thank you for that, Ray. And I confess, Joe, I am interested in the question that you mentioned early on while, while we still have lots of people on. Whether it's this or something like it, do people have ideas for how we could use it? People, these people have donated their images and captions and given permission that it can be used. And sure, a website or something. But I just wonder, we have such a great group here, if there's other ideas. I think, I think they set it as an example. They had a campaign called the Graying of AIDS. They talked about people aging and how that was captured in different stories. I think this something could be done in the same way where it's kind of unstructured, but it just has the essence of the campaign, what it is, and just people's little narratives. And if people want to expound on their narrative, fine. If not, fine. That kind of thing. And even having other people's comments about each image all captured in, in one space would also would could, could be a way in which it could be uh, utilized. Or it could be put in different category, category, categories of stigmatization. And people can say, well, I'm feeling this kind of stigma. Let me go here. Like almost like an ABC is a stigma, <laughs> you know? And you can go here and look at this kind of stigma and say, oh, that helped me for today. You know, or it could be a daily, understanding of what stigma looks like. I'll be quiet because I'll talk all the way through this. <laughs> no, this is good. We want to hear people's ideas. So thank you, Brian. And we see a, a bunch in the chat as well. You know, I just wanted to make a comment, Joe. One of the things I am hearing, which I think is so powerful, is that sharing these stories and seeing other people sharing their narrative or story um, makes you, Rick, Rick, you did such a wonderful job of talking about this and how, you know, it makes you feel, you know, connected and you see that there are, you have more in common than you think on the surface. Um, so that's one reason that this is so powerful, but then I think related to that is part of the shared experience is this experience of injustice, maybe that people have faced. Um, and I think that that, though, it can be so harmful and damaging. And of course, we would never want anybody to experience injustice. It's almost like that oppression brings people together in a really powerful way. Um, and this was like a medium to, to uh, put that on display in a way. Um, so I don't know if there was really anything I was trying to say, but I just found that like really interesting to think about. And, um, you know, though this was not photo voice in the photo voice methodology, there's a, there's an activism component to it. So, you know, these stories really do speak to that. Um, these images speak to that. Um, I'd like to share, I'm Jeffrey Haskins from Philadelphia Fight. Um, we have a, um, you know, this, uh, this idiom of photographs, we've been able to take people who wanted to, and sometimes I agree, I agree with Brian. Um, sometimes it's not the story, but sometimes it's about the message and about speaking your truth. Um, and I heard that about the advocacy. And so in our name is Philadelphia Fight. So we're all about advocacy. And what these pictures have done as we take different persons, um, intersectionality from all of our different clients um, and post them on the wall next to in our clinics and all through our buildings has helped people um, really do some phenomenal things. It's helped with community engagement. It's helped with people going to virtually getting virally suppressed. It's helped with people accessing care, staying in care. Um, and instead of trying to do it the way that HRSA asked us to do it or CDC asked us to do it, it came from our community. 
Um, we decided what our program is. We decided what our education programs are. And just by looking at those pictures, walking past them every day, we're encouraged on a daily basis, those of us as staff and those of us as clients, um, and even the funders, when they see it, they're encouraged to do more. Um, and so that has expanded our program from just Philadelphia to now our program is going statewide in Pennsylvania. And so we're moving, not just with the city health department, but we're moving with the state health department. And I think your last comment, and that'll be my last comment, is the pitchers need to talk. They need to talk. And so the other component I would add to it is like you said, there, is, there needs to be the voice component because some people are visual learners and some people are learning by hearing the message or, the conv or in the conversation. And so that's our next step where we're gonna start putting voices to those pictures on the wall. I have one personally that hangs in my classroom. Um, and when I needed to get my message out and tell that story to several of my community, black, gay men who are still the number one acquisition of HIV, we acquire it most. Um, I've seen an increase in our clinic for those because we, you know, we we are a federally qualified health center. So you know we got those restrictions and those things we can do, but we still grassroots and we all and we still came up when we were ASO. And so the ways of working those kind of things to be on the front line and still getting messages out and having conversations with people in the community, like your community advisory board members then we stay on track and we meet our needs to serve the community. So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I'm noticing some folks uh, in the chat and it is two o'clock. So people have things that they want to go to in the conference is coming up in 15 minutes or they need to get back to since we're uh, virtual. So I think we'll respect that. But um, and 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 our session here. But of course, we can stay connected through the conference. And Joe again posted if you're interested in this particular work group, um, the link there. There are also other work groups connected to the to the annual conference that you might be interested in. And you can find those on the uh, the usual website for for the uh, who can you tell? Thank you everybody for being here and for all your contributions um, and for all the work you do every day. Take care. Thank you, guys.